thank you that you do abide with us. Indeed, we are your temple, that we are your people who have the Holy Spirit dwelling within, our comforter, our guide, our teacher. And we pray, O oh Lord, that this time of, of study and time of singing and time of prayer, and also in this form of fellowship, that, that Father, we would be strengthened and revived and renewed in our love for Christ and our love for one another. O oh, Father, we pray that in all things we would be surrendered to you, submitted to your leading and to your word. We ask, Lord, again, you'll give us patience as we wait upon you in regard to being able to gather together in person. We pray for your spirit and, and might to open that door for us. We look unto you for you are able to do what we are not able to do. We also pray, Lord, that as we have your word taught tonight, that if there are any discouraged, that you would encourage their hearts. If there are any that are being tempted and tried, we pray that you would console them and lift them up. We also pray, Father, for any that are unsaved, if there be any listening and watching, we pray that the Spirit of God would take that word to their hearts and that they would be made alive to follow Christ. So I again pray, Lord, that you would use me as your instrument. In weakness, I pray that your message from your word would be uh, what is empowered and empowers us to give you all praise and glory and live for you. We just ask, Lord, that, that we would have ears to hear and that you would give us illumination of the truth of your word so we'd understand it, believe it, and live in it. And we praise you for this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Now, when it comes to a New Year's like this, which happens every year, has been for as long as we know, people have been celebrating the, the, the turn of the clock and uh, the turn of the year. Of course, we follow a different calendar than some other places in the world, but they also celebrate at that time of year. And along with the celebrations are many who make New Year's resolutions. And for most, they resolve to maybe change a habit, uh, resolve to eat and live healthy lives. For myself, I've made two uh, New Year's resolutions. My first New Year's resolution is don't break promises. And my second resolution is don't promise to diet. And so hopefully those two will be kept. Well, there are also those who resolve that they are going to change their lives so that they will be remembered, remembered for something they've done or something they've said. Well, this evening we're going to look at a man, one man who wanted to be remembered, and in the process he wanted to become rich, he wanted to become famous. And this man became a prophet who was greedy. He was greedy for profit, and in the end he's been remembered, but not for good reasons, not for godly reasons. And this man's name was Balaam. And we read about his reputation beginning in 2 Peter chapter 2. I'm going to read several verses from this portion. It's not the portion we're going to stay in this evening, but it helps us begin in understanding and in being introduced to this man. So 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 12. says, but these as natural brute beasts made to be taken and destroyed speak evil of the things that they understand not, and they shall utterly perish in their own corruption, and shall receive the reward of unrighteousness as those that count it pleasure to riot in the daytime. Their spots and blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you, having eyes full of adultery, and that cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls, and hearts they have exercised with covetous practices, 
Cursed children, which have forsaken the right way and are gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Bosor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness, but was rebuked for his iniquity. The dumb ass, speaking with man's voice, forbade the madness of the prophet. Now, the mention of Balaam by the apostle Peter was not just to present a biography of this person, but rather was written for the purpose of warning the church. It concerned those who entered into the church, and they presented themselves as representatives and spokesmen for God. But as Peter wrote here, we see that they were, in fact, representatives of the devil. God views them with such disdain that he also compares them to wild beasts, which were to be, uh, in order to keep the population safe from them, they would be taken away and destroyed. And it's no coincidence that Peter does refer to both beast and Balaam in the same breath. An animal is a big part of the historical narrative with Balaam, as well as the spiritual application for us. We looked at this morning at four different creatures that God has created, and we've received wisdom from those creatures. Balaam was going to receive even more than just wisdom. He was going to receive a rebuke from a beast, from an animal. And the beast was none other than a donkey who God had the power to, or gave that donkey the power to speak. Who was the one who deserved to be taken and destroyed? Was it the donkey or was it Balaam? Well, of course, as we see with Peter, it would have been Balaam that was the one that deserved to be destroyed. The lowly beast of burden was carrying a greater burden, and that was this man Balaam, because he loved the wages of unrighteousness. The, this prophet was greedy for Prophet. Now, with that, I'd ask you to turn in your Bibles now to the book of Numbers, Numbers 22. And it is at Numbers 22 where we're going to look at and we read about the this prophet and the madness of this prophet and also the donkey who was given the ability to speak and to rebuke Balaam. We're not going to have time to read all of it, every verse, but we're going to begin at verse 1. And it's important to understand the circumstances that led up to a conversation between this man Balaam and his donkey. And so reading at verse 1, it says, And the children of Israel set forward and pitched in the plains of Moab on the side Jordan, on this side of Jordan by Jericho. And Balak, the son of Zippor, saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites. And Moab was sore afraid of the people because there were many. And Moab was distressed because of the children of Israel. And Moab said unto the elders of Midian, Now shall this company lick up all that are round about us as the ox licks up the grass of the field. And Balak, the son of Zippor, was king of the Moabites at that time. Now, the Moabites were a Canaanite nation, but they were actually were related to the Israelites, to the Hebrew children. Moab, of which they were named, was the son of Lot. You remember Lot was the nephew of Abraham? Well, Moab's birth was brought about by incest with Lot and his oldest daughter after the destruction of Sodom because they had escaped to, from that destruction. And when Lot's daughters thought that they were going to be the only ones left in this world, they, they uh, got their father drunk. And Moab was born through this sin. And Moab grew up. He became head of a large tribe. And over time, they rejected God. They forgot God. They became idolaters, and they didn't worship Jehovah, but they worshiped Chemosh, and that idol, that false god, 
required that they offer their children as sacrifices. And so they were, they were very wicked. Some people wonder why in the Old Testament, why there were commands given by God for nations to be wiped out. I believe this is one of the major reasons was because of the way they were putting their children in the fires, showing that God is one who brings judgment on those who treat the most innocent, uh, the most gentle, the most helpless of our society and treat them with such disdain, such hatred. And we could say that our nation itself is fallen into that same sort of thing. Well, years later, Balak was king. He was king of Moab. We find here that the children of Israel who had been delivered from slavery in Egypt had set up their tents in, in this Jordan Valley. They were right on the doorsteps of the promised land. And so the Moabites, they see all these tents, all the people there. And it says in verse 3 that they were so afraid. They were so terrified because they heard the news of their... their uh, uh, other nation of the Amorites, other tribes of the Amorites, who uh, had been basically destroyed at that time by these liberated slaves. And so with this fear, they wondered, what are we to do? And so the king wonders this as well, the king of Moab. And so it says on in verse 5, He sent messengers, therefore, unto Balaam, the son of Peor, to Pithor, which is by the river of the land of the children of his people, to call him, saying, Behold, there is a people come out from Egypt. Behold, they cover the face of the earth, and they abide over against me. Come now, therefore, I pray thee, curse me this people, for they are too mighty for me. For adventure I shall prevail, that we may smite them, that I might drive them out of the land. For I would that he whom you bless is blessed, and he whom you curse is cursed. So Balaam did have a reputation. And so the king of Moab, when he sees how many Hebrew tents there are, how many people are, and this fear is welling up within his people and in himself, and they think that they're not able to win victory over this uh, this large multitude of people simply through a fight, through a battle. So knowing the reputation of Balaam, they send for Balaam. His reputation is as a magician, as a diviner of spirits. He's definitely not a worshiper of God, the true God. He's known to the king, and so he asks Balaam, come. He says, I know who you bless or bless. You, I know who you curse or cursed. Now, this idea about cursing, this was based on the belief that if you could get the god or the gods of the enemy nation that you're fighting with to turn on their own people, they would become weak and they would lose the war, the battles. Among the Canaanite nations, it was this superstition that it included all their tribal deities and spirits. And so before they went to war, what they wanted to do was make sure that the deities had their back and that they were on their side, not on the side of the other nations. And so if Balaam, in his mind, in his, in his uh, thoughts, is if Balaam could get Jehovah, the God of Israel, to turn against Israel, then they would be able to trap him, trap them with their, their own gods, and they would be victorious. Now, it's interesting when you think of it that in some ways there's truth to this. And this is the deception of Satan, always using a, a form of truth, but twisting it, twisting the scriptures. Because, yes, when the people of God were turned against God and turned away from God, then God held back from giving them victory. And they would lose battles. They would lose wars. And so, again, there is this bit of truth, but taken by the enemy, the king of darkness, the, the angel of light, and twists it. And this is what Balaam is. He's an angel of light, a twister of truth. And so we see the error of Balaam in verse 8. And he said unto them, Lodge here this night, and I will bring you word again, as the Lord shall speak unto me. 
And the princes of Moab abode with Balaam. Now, again, Balaam was not a true prophet of God. What we can note about him, though, is that he knows who Jehovah is. He knows about Israel's God. And he knows that this God is someone you want to have on your side. He's heard all the stories. And so Balaam, not being a worshiper of Jehovah, yet he seems to us at first to recognize that Jehovah is a real God. Jehovah is a true God. And he plans even to spend time in prayer, seeking to get the will of this God. You see, it was very common back then, and it could be even today among these practitioners of divination and spirits that they call on gods and goddesses of the people that they were wanting to bless, again, in such a way to seek to turn them away from their people. So very deceptive, gives a form of truth, but very much in darkness. And so we see the Lord and Balaam, though, do have a conversation. You see that in verses 9 through 12, where Balaam, he asks God to curse the people. Uh, the Lord refuses, and so Balaam in the morning, he tells the messengers that he cannot go with them. If he can't persuade Israel's God, then he's, he's not going to act. Uh, God says they are blessed people. God says they're his people. And so he does not allow Balaam to go and curse them. But Balaam is a stubborn man. He's got a stubborn heart. And so he tells the messengers he cannot go. They go back to the king. He turns and sends them back with an even greater reward of payment. Balaam, he's seen this, of what he will get from this. And so he really wants Jehovah, he wants God to do what he wants him to do. Yet God again says no. He does not allow Balaam and will not allow him to curse his people. And then again in verse 19, he, he basically says, uh, Now therefore I pray you, tarry ye also here this night, that I may know what the Lord will say unto me. So he says, stay overnight. He's, he's trying to get time, which he can... See if he can change the mind of God. Quite a foolish man, as you see it. And with his knowledge, his sinful desire for fame, for fortune is so strong. And as Peter said of him, he loved the wages of unrighteousness. And so jumping down there to verse 20, and we'll carry on from there. And God came unto Balaam at night and said to him, if the men come to call you, rise up and go with them. But yet the word which I shall say unto you, you shall, that you shall do. And Balaam rose up in the morning and saddled his ass and went with the princes of Moab. And God's anger was kindled because he went. And the angel of the Lord stood in the way for an adversary against him. Now he was riding upon his ass and his two servants were with him. The ass saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way and his sword drawn in his hand. And the ass turned aside out of the way and went into the field. And Balaam smote the ass to turn her into the way. But the angel of the Lord stood in the path of the vineyards, a wall being on this side and a wall on that side. And when the ass saw the angel of the Lord, she thrust herself unto the wall and crushed Balaam's foot against the wall, and he smote her again. Now the events have actually... Uh, gone over several days, they passed several days. And so again, just summarizing here what happened. The emissary sent by the king came with this payment of div divination and told Balaam what they wanted him to do. Balaam really wanted to go. His heart was filled with this desire for money, for fame. He wanted to go. This would be the best thing for his career. He'd become famous. He'd become wealthy. His only purpose in praying to God is to get God to allow him to do what he wants, not what God desires. It's what it said if in James 4, verse 3. He is following what it says there. You ask and receive not because you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your lusts. That's the spirit in which he's praying to Jehovah. It's not that he wants to reverence and worship Jehovah. He wants to have the things that he lusts after. 
But God told him not to go, and so with regret he told them. They went back to the king, but the king sent them again, and so Balaam asked them to wait, again trying to get God to give him that permission, hoping he'd let him go. But finally God did give him a yellow light. Say a yellow light, it wasn't a green light for him to go. He said he could go if they came to him in the morning and asked him to go with him, with them. And the sense is that if they came and woke him up and says, come with us, then he could go. That, was, that would be like a sign. And they did not do this. See, Balaam made sure he was up before them. The, the sense of the text indicates it by the way God was angry with him for going because they did not actually be the first to ask him. He was ready there to go right with them when they were ready to leave. And so the Lord was not pleased. He was angry. His anger was kindled against this greedy, false prophet. And so with greed, he goes with these men. And while on the way, the donkey makes things difficult. We see here for Balaam and it made Balaam so angry, so furious that we read further in verse 26. The angel of the Lord went further and stood in a narrow place where was no way to turn either to the right hand or to the left. When the ass saw the angel of the Lord, she fell down under Balaam and Balaam's anger was kindled. And he smote the ass with a staff and the Lord opened the mouth, mouth of the ass and she said unto Balaam, What have I done unto you that you have smitten me these three times? Balaam said unto the ass, Because you have mocked me. I would there were a sword in my hand, for now would I kill you. The ass said unto Balaam, Am I not your ass upon which you have ridden ever since I was yours unto this day? Was I ever wont to do so unto you? He said, No. Then the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way, and his sword drawn in his hand. He bowed down his head and fell flat on his face. You may have heard about the ape that sat in its cage holding a Bible and a book on evolution. And he had a confused look on its face. And so someone asked him what he was doing while I was reading these two books. And he answered, well, I'm trying to decide if I'm my brother's keeper or my keeper's brother. And then there's another poem that says, once I was a tadpole, Beginning to begin. Then I was a frog with my tail tucked in. Then I was a monkey in a banyan tree. Now I am a professor with a PhD. Well, we know that it's not normal for animals to talk, talk in this way. The talking of animals is something, you know, reserved for children's books and fairy tales. As we saw this morning from the book of Proverbs, God does use animals to teach us certain things, but they normally don't speak intelligent words to us and have a conversation with us in which we can ask them questions and they can answer back or they can ask us questions, we can answer back and so on. But in the Bible, there are at least two periods or two times that God gave speech to animals, that there was a speech within animals. The first was in the Garden of Eden, you know, in that case, it was the serpent that spoke and deceived Eve. He spoke lies, deception, and spoke against God, the nature of God, the character of God, and was cursed for that. The second is here where God opens the mouth of a donkey. Now, unlike Birds that can mimic things we teach them to say. We have one of those birds. Brad has one, and it's learning a few words. In this instance, this donkey, unlike the serpent, speaks these words of, of speaking in terms of truth. Intelligent words as a means to reveal to this wicked prophet, false prophet, to reveal to him that he is under God's judgment to reveal the nature and character of God who is about and ready to take his life. 
Note that God not only opened the mouth of the donkey, he also opened the eyes of Balaam. Balaam sees before him this angel of the Lord with his sword drawn. We can only imagine that this would be a pre-incarnate uh, uh, entrance of Jesus before his birth in the flesh. But the angel of the Lord, the messenger of the Lord, is often that presentation of, of our Lord. And we see him here ready with his sword drawn. And at the sight of the Lord, ready to cut him down, Balaam falls flat on his face. This is very much similar to when John saw Jesus in his resurrection form on the island of Patmos, and he fell on his face before him and worshipped him. But with Balaam, it's more than just, just a, a, a worship as one who is a, a follower, a disciple of Christ, but one who knows that he's under the judgment of God. And he, he fears for his very soul and life, and he falls flat on his face before him. And so this is a position of defeat and also desperation and despair. He knows that the donkey saw more than he saw, that this donkey knew more than he knew. And he knows that he's worthy to be struck down while his donkey doesn't deserve the beatings that he's given them, given him. And we see this within the nature of, of man. Man seeks more and more power. Man seeks supremacy over God. Man seeks to try to form God into their own image and seeks to challenge God to be what they want God to be. And they seek to, to bring down God from his supremacy over all things, the God who created them. And the more they do this, the more they act not like the intelligence that God created us to be, but to be more like unintelligent animals. And here in this true account, the angel of the Lord stands as this adversary of man ready to strike him dead. Yet man in his stubbornness and wickedness is blind to the things of God. And yet the donkey, this creature that the world would look upon as having very little intelligence, only useful for carrying bags and bundles and people, it's this creature that sees, and he knows the danger that is before him. So the question, or the declaration be, will the real donkey stand up? Isaiah 1 verse 2 says, Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. I have nourished and brought up children. They have rebelled against me. The ox knows his owner, and the ass his master's crib. But Israel does not know. My people do not consider. See, mankind has not changed. Take some of the simple, clear, and precise warnings today that are very common, but are still unheeded by people. There's many things that we, we read of statistics of, excuse me, of statistics where people uh, get killed because of drunk driving. Yet people still do it. And other things that cause physical sickness that can lead to early death. People still follow those. And this is the way uh, of the heart of the stubborn heart before God. That even though they know the wages of sin is death, they still pursue them. While the ox knows its master and the ass is master's prayer. So what I'm trying to put forward is the foolishness of people. The animals, like this donkey, knew the danger ahead. He saw the danger ahead and responded while Balaam could not see it. The donkey, again, considered unintelligent, saw and knew the danger and swerved. And the man who was looked on by the world, by the king of Moab, as being the wise man to call upon to help him, He's the one that lacked all intelligence, all wisdom. He was but a foolish man, blind to the truth of God, stubborn with a heart depraved, couldn't see, could not recognize the danger before him. So he was like a blind man who was walking toward a cliff, and he pushed on blinded by this 
desire to gain riches, to gain fame and power and influence. That's what pushed him onward. Whenever the donkey moved to the side, oh, his anger kindled within him. He wanted to get there to get what he believed he deserved, pursuing the pleasures of sin for a season, but neglecting what is far more needful. He's neglecting his soul. Again, will the real donkey please stand up? Now, in just these few verses, we really get a clear insight into the heart of Balaam. His fame, his reputation, biblically speaking, was not good at all. Even though he saw the danger before him, he would, because of his greed, determine to lead Israel from God. Even after this event, of seeing the angel of the Lord with his sword drawn, he would pursue still a desire that he had in his heart for the riches of unrighteousness. Jude wrote in verse 11 of Jude, he said, Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward and perished, the gainsaying of Korah. See, this is his reputation. He pursued this evil. He pursued this pleasures of sin for a season. Even when he spoke with God and God gave him these words of truth and saying, no, you will not go. But his heart was wicked toward God. And this is the main purpose, I believe, that Moses was inspired by God to include this man in the actions that he took and have that included in the, in the Bible. Because Balaam, what he does is he stands out in the Bible as one who not only forsook the right way because of his love for the wages of unrighteousness, but like false teachers of the past and today, his desire was to not be alone in this, but to lead others to follow the wrong path, to forsake the right path, to do so with him, because in his desire was not to have the reputation before God. It was to have the reputation before man. Again, we don't have time for the whole story, but I'm sure you know it well. Balaam did go, and at first he did what God commanded. He blessed the people of Israel. He spoke of God's promise of salvation to the nation and the world. And the king of Moab was very angry with him. And he tried to get him over and over again, several times, to curse the people of Israel. But God always spoke through him his word of blessing and made known of the promise even of the Savior that was to come. He prophesied God's word concerning Jesus the Messiah in Numbers 24. This is getting nearer the time in which Moab, the, the king of Moab, has been sacrificing and sacrificing and sacrificing all these oxen and, and telling him, I'll give you more money. I want you to curse them. But this is one of the blessings that God made Balaam pronounce, proclaim. Numbers 24, verse 17, I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not nigh. There shall come a star out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel, and shall smite the corners of Moab, and destroy all the children of Sheth. And Edom shall be a possession. Seir also shall be a possession for his enemies, and Israel shall do valiantly. Out of Jacob shall come he that shall have dominion, shall destroy him that remains of the city. You can all, almost imagine the anger that was coming out of the, the heart and mind of the king of Moab when Balaam, who has been paid handsomely to curse the people of Israel, gives these great blessings and includes the thought, the, the promise that they shall smite the corners of Moab. He's basically seeing Balaam bless Israel, bless God's people, and yet 
a curse Moab. How amazing that, that such a clear word from the Lord was spoken through such a foolish man. But of course, we know that if, if God could speak through a donkey, he can speak through whomever he chooses. This man who prophesied great blessing was being used of God, even though he was not a man of God. It just shows, again, the sovereignty of God, that he will have his way, he will have his purpose, he will have his word go out, and it will not return void. Now, even though this man did prophesy great blessing shortly after, because he was not able to curse them, he came up with a plan. And the plan was to tempt the man of Israel to bring about the fall of the people of Israel through lusts, through idolatry. So this man who prophesied great blessing led the people of Israel into sin, whereby they brought the curse upon themselves, not through his words, but by, by their falling into the lusts and temptations of the idolatrous women and, and people. And in the end, because of this, God judged Balaam and had his own life taken from him. He lost his life. Numbers 31 verse 8 tells us there that they slew the kings of Midian beside the rest of them that were slain, namely Evi and Rechem and Zerah and Hur and Reba, five kings of Midian. Balaam also, the son of Beor, they slew with the sword. That is the last word of Balaam in terms of his life. It was, he was slewn with the sword. That was his end. That was the payment that he received for unrighteousness. In Revelation 2, Jesus speaking to the church in Pergamos says in verse 14, but I have a few things against you because you have there those that hold the doctrine of Balaam who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. So we see that that form of leading people astray by men and women who come and claim to be speaking the word of God, and maybe even at the first, they seem to give a good message. And yet their purpose is to lead people not to God, but astray. And that is a great warning for the church. And he warned the church in a uh, church in Pergamos that you had those who were holding to this doctrine. They were basically pursuing this doctrine. And we know that the church in Corinth that was dealing with similar things when they had the man who was committing sexual perversion, sexual sin, that Paul said even the Gentiles blush over. Man says he comes from a monkey, yet the monkey declares the majesty and the creation of God. Man says everything in the universe came from nothing but a big bang. The universe declares the glory and the might of an intelligent, sovereign creator. Man says we are animals that millions of years ago climbed out of the slime. And that is why we find that so many live like animals and not as humans. That they live in perversion and sin because they are acting more like the animals than the humans that God created us to be. While the animals know their creator and we see that with this donkey there are two dangers that the church must learn i believe from this story not everyone who comes saying they speak for the lord are true preachers sent from god this calls for the church to be on guard on guard from the likes of balaam sadly in our past not too long past we've had several uh, through the evangelical movement who have proven themselves that they were not truly steadfast in Christ. 
and easily led astray by, by the riches of this world and the, the lusts of the flesh. Bible tells us when somebody falls into these things that if it's a brother or sister, we are to seek to restore them, but do so with the understanding that we all are capable of great sin and of falling. And so the church must always be on guard of this. Not paranoid, but on guard. And how are we on guard? It's by knowing the word of God, loving the word of God, and being surrendered to the word of God. We must be as the Bereans. We must study to know that we're not following false angels of light. And the second is that we must run from the sin of greed. That we minister and do church, not for earthly reasons, but for heavenly reasons. Balaam loved money. And the love of money is the root of all evil. And even a true saint can fall to the temptation of fame and wealth. As Jesus, who humbled himself and did not seek for glory in the world, we are called to follow him. That we might humbly serve and glorify God for what is eternal. Jesus says, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust does corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust does corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. What's your treasure and where is your heart? Oh, that people would see that people's hearts would be humbled and broken before God, that men and women would be brought to see the God of heaven and earth, that he is the one to be looked upon and followed, and trusted and worshipped, to see that this God who stands with his wrath revealed against ungodly men, as it was before Balaam, he also stands for his people. And he has provided for sinners the greatest gift, his only son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so which donkey would you be in this story? And I ask that for myself. Which donkey? The ass or Balaam? The donkey was beaten three times. Interesting that that's mentioned. And we know that Jesus was crucified. He was beaten. And then he was buried for three days, then he rose again the third day. He's the savior of men. And he, like that donkey, he came between us and the sword of God's wrath. So may stubborn hearts be removed and humble hearts look to him who made the heavens and the earth, the one who has the power to make donkeys talk and to stop the mouth of a false prophet from cursing. Instead, let's have lips and hearts that bless him and glorify him and thank him and be used of him to, to bless each other, to bless each other with the true, precious word of God. For it is that word which revives us, strengthens us, and indeed blesses us. In reference to the prophecy that was made concerning the star that would come out of Judah, we have celebrated the, the wonderful birth of Christ and the mention of the star, the Christmas star, as it were, and how that it was through this star that would come that he would be ruler and king out of Judah. Someone wrote, and I'll end with this, a poem about that. It says, O dawn of peace and gladness, that breaks from sea to sea. Behold, it shine with joy divine on ancient Galilee. For Judah's star is risen, her night has passed away. The Lord, the King Emmanuel, is born this holy day. O dawn of peace and gladness that thrills the heart of earth, when bells of joy their tones employ to tell a Savior's birth. When hill and plain and valley repeat the angel's cry, and sing in mighty chorus all praise to God Most High. O dawn of peace and gladness, 
We read the holy sign, the tidings sweet our tongues repeat in songs of praise divine. For Judah's star is risen, let Zion's host proclaim, all hail the son of David, O oh, magnify his name. May the Lord bless through this study of a donkey who spoke with the word of God and Balaam who had to also surrender and submit and speak the word of God even as a false prophet and he did receive the wages of unrighteousness. Praise the Lord to the star that arose. We have received from him the wage of righteousness. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Brothers, will you lead us?